thank you all for coming out. Uh, welcome to Majors and Quinn Booksellers. Uh, in just a minute, I'll bring out Joshua Floor, and he'll talk about his book, Moonwalking with Einstein, The Art and Science of Remembering Everything. Um, but first, I want to um, make sure that you uh, know that we do all sorts of events here in the store. Uh, there's a little flyer on the chair, and more up front if you would like, uh, listing some of the great ones we've got coming up. Um, in the next couple months, we're going to have Philip Connors, who used to be an editor at the Wall Street Journal, who quit his job to uh, spend summers in a fire lookout in New Mexico and practice his writing craft. He'll be in talking about his new book, uh, uh, Fire Season. Uh, Sam Lipsight, who's a very funny uh, novelist, who's written a very funny black comedy called The Ass, uh, will be here. Uh, Wendy McClure is a children's book editor who took time off from her job to follow the Laura Ingalls Wilder trail and devote herself to all things Laura. She makes butter, she makes her own pinafores, she's tracked down all the conventions and everything. She's written a really funny book called The Wilder Life. Uh, Catherine Friend will be here. She lives in southwest Minnesota with her partner. They raise sheep. She became a little disenchanted with the sheep uh, a couple years ago, but has learned to love them again and has made a book out of it. It's a very funny book. Uh, she'll be here until, uh, she'll be here in May. Uh, the director, John Sayles, will be here at the end of May. Uh, the director of Mate One and Lone Star is also a novelist. Uh, he's got a new book out from McSweeney's. Uh, it's a very sweeping uh, historical novel. It uh, starts in the American occupied Philippines and continues forward from there. And in the middle of July, we're going to have the author uh, and poet Sapphire here. Sapphire wrote the book Push, which became the movie Precious. And she's back with her new novel, which is a sequel to that. Uh, so she'll be here in the middle of July. Um, you can always uh, find out who's coming by stopping in the store. You can visit majorsandquin.com. You can find us on Facebook. You can follow us on Twitter. Um, but I hope what you'll do is come back and talk to uh, okay, my name tag and talk to somebody <laughs> who works here because we'd love to see you back in the store. So, without any further ado, Joshua Ford. Tape. I mean, he 
He saw you could have conversations with him. You could talk to him for a couple minutes before you realized that there was something deeply, profoundly wrong with this man. And uh, I was, you know, was like, who's the last president you remember? I thought about it for a second. Uh, F FDR? Like, what about John F. Kennedy? Never heard of him. He's like, Bill Clinton? Bill Clinton! Of course! Great guy! Bill Clinton, yes! Great scientist! I worked with him, you know. Oh. And I'm like, uh... <laughs> and, you know, unless there's some other Bill Clinton that you're thinking of. Um, what was probably most surprising about this guy, you think, was that he was content. Uh, he lived like this kind of perfect pathological Buddha. Uh, suspended in an eternal present between this past that he couldn't contemplate and this future that he couldn't think about for long enough to think about. Uh, he, it was as though he had fallen completely out of time. And I wanted to read briefly a section from uh, the book, from a chapter about EP, about the relationship between memory and time. Without time, there would be no need for a memory. But without a memory, would there be such a thing as time? I don't mean time in the sense that, say, physicists speak of it. The fourth dimension, the independent variable, the quantity that compresses when you approach the speed of light. I mean psychological time, the tempo at which we experience life's passage. Time as a mental construct. Watching E.P. struggle to recount his own age, I recalled one of the stories Ed Cook had told me about his research at the University of Paris when we met at the U.S. Memory Championship. I'm working on expanding subjective time so that it feels like I live longer, Ed had mumbled to me on the sidewalk outside the Con Ed headquarters, a cigarette dangling from his mouth. The idea is to avoid that feeling you have when you get to the end of the year and you're like, where the hell did that go? How are you going to do that, I asked him. By remembering more by providing my life with more chronological landmarks, by making myself more aware of time's passage. I told him that his plan reminded me of Dunbar, the pilot uh, in Joseph Heller's Catch-22, who reasons that since time flies when you're having fun, the surest way to slow life's passage is to make it as boring as possible. Ed shrugged, quite the opposite. The more we pack our lives with memories, the slower time seems to fly. Our subjective experience of time is highly variable. We all know that days can pass like weeks and months can feel like years, and that the opposite can be just as true. A month or a year can zoom by in what feels like no time at all. Our lives are structured by our memories of events. Event X happened just before the big Paris vacation. I was doing Y in the summer after I learned to drive. Z happened the weekend after I landed my first job. We remember events by positioning them in time relative to other events. Just as we accumulate memories of facts by integrating them into a network, we accumulate life experiences by integrating them into a web of other chronological memories. The denser the web, the denser the experience of time. It's a point well illustrated by Michel Sith, a French chronobiologist. He studies uh, the relationship between time and living organisms, who conducted one of the most extraordinary acts in the history of uh, scientific self-experimentation. In 1962, Sif spent two months living in total isolation in a subterranean cave without access to clock, calendar, or sun. Sleeping and eating only when his body told him to, he sought to discover how the natural rhythms of human life would be affected by living, quote unquote, beyond time. Very quickly, Sif's memory deteriorated. In the dreary darkness, his days melded into one another and became one continuous, indistinguishable since there was nobody to talk to and not much to do, there was nothing novel to impress itself upon his memory. There were no chronological landmarks by which he could measure the passage of time. At some point, he stopped being able to remember even what happened the day before. His experience in isolation had turned him into EP. As time began to blur, he became effectively amnesiac. <clears throat> Soon his sleep patterns disintegrated. Some days he'd stay awake for 36 straight hours, other days for 8, without being able to tell the difference. When his support team on the surface finally called down to him on September 14th, the day his experiment was scheduled to wrap up, it was only August 20th in his journal. 
he thought only a month had gone by. His experience of time's passage had compressed by a factor of two. <clears throat> Monotony collapses time, novelty unfolds it. You can exercise daily and eat healthily and live a long life while experiencing a short one. If you spend your life sitting in a cubicle and passing papers, one day is bound to blend unmemorably into the next and disappear. That's why it's so important to change routines regularly and take vacations to exotic locales and have as many new experiences as possible that can serve to anchor our memories. Creating new memories stretches out psychological time and lengthens the perception of our lives. William James first wrote about the curious warping and foreshortening of psychological time in his Principles of Psychology in 1890. In youth, we may have an absolutely new experience, subjective or objective, every hour of the day. Apprehension is vivid, retentiveness strong, and our recollections of that time, like those of a time spent in rapid and interesting travel, are of something intricate, multitudinous, and long drawn out, he wrote. But as each passing year converts some of this experience into automatic routine, which we hardly note at all, notice at all, the days and the weeks smooth themselves out in recollection to contentless units and the years grow hollow and collapse. Life seems to speed up as we get older, because life gets less memorable as we get older. If to remember is to be human, then remembering more means being more human, said Ed. There's perhaps a bit of Peter Pan to Ed's quest to make, make his life maximally memorable. But of all the things one could be obsessive about collecting, memories of one's own life don't seem like the most unreasonable. There's something even strangely rational about it. There's an old philosophical conundrum it often gets bandied about in introductory philosophy courses. In the 19th century, doctors began to wonder whether the general anesthetic that they had been administering to patients <clears throat> might not actually put the patients to sleep so much as freeze their muscles and erase their memories of the surgery. And if that were the case, could the doctors be said to have done anything wrong? Like the proverbial tree that falls without anyone hearing it, can an experience that isn't remembered be meaningfully said to have happened at all? Socrates thought the unexamined life was not worth living, how much more so the unremembered life. <coughs> so, EP is one end of the spectrum. And at the other end of the spectrum, there is this rather bizarre contest that's held every spring in New York City called the United States Memory Championship. And a few years ago, I went to cover this event as a science journalist. Uh, Basically thinking that it was going to be, I don't know what I was thinking. I guess I figured it was going to be a collection of people with photographic memory or somehow they were going to be freaks of nature. These people could memorize hundreds of random numbers, the names of hundreds of strangers, entire poems, shuffled decks of playing cards. It was crazy. It was outrageous. And I showed up and discovered something uh, that surprised me, which was that the people who competed in this contest all professed to have average memories, and all claimed that they, that they had trained themselves to perform these incredible mental gymnastics. And I was like, I don't really believe you. Uh, it's just hard, it's amazing. And uh, I was at, outside the, the, the competition hall, and this guy, Ed Cook, who I mentioned in this, that excerpt, uh, that reading, was smoking a cigarette, he smokes way too many cigarettes. And uh, he said to me, well, you're a journalist. Do you know Britney Spears? <laughs> I was like, no. <laughs> I don't know Britney Spears. Why? <laughs> he said, yeah. uh, by the way, he's British. So um, if that matters. And uh, I, he was like, because I really want to teach Britney Spears how to memorize a deck of playing cards on U.S. national television that will prove to the world that anyone can do this. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, okay, um, well, maybe you could teach me. I mean, you got to start somewhere. And uh, he did teach me. And I ended up spending the better part of the next year uh, training my memory and also trying to understand it, to understand why it works, why it sometimes doesn't work, and what its potential might be. And turns out there's this, all of these, uh, there's a whole collection of uh, memory techniques that were invented 